Big thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Stick around till the end to learn about our special offer. Let's say that I wanted to specify the temperature in a city, like New York for instance. How would I do that? Well, I could simply use a number with a corresponding unit, like 273 Kelvin. In other words, I could use a quantity which just has a magnitude. I could use a scalar to specify the temperature. So to specify the temperature in New York, I just need this single number, this single component to specify the temperature. Of course, there are no basis vectors involved in specifying this component because it's just the magnitude. Temperature doesn't have a direction. As a result, one could say that there are zero basis vectors for this one component or zero basis vectors per component. Now, staying with New York, suppose I wanted to know the displacement, not the distance, the displacement from the JFK airport at point A to the top of the Empire State Building at point B. How would I specify this displacement? Well, in this case, I would need to give you the magnitude of the displacement, which is about 22.5 kilometers, as well as the direction, which is, of course, in the direction specified by the vector AB. Therefore, I would need a vector, a quantity that has both a magnitude and a direction, to specify the displacement between the airport and the Empire State Building. One thing about this vector is that I can actually break it up into three components because I'm in three dimensions. So if I had a coordinate system where the x-axis was going from east to west, the y-axis was going from north to south, and the z-axis was going from up to down, then I could specify the displacement using three components. For instance, I could say that in order to go from A to B, you should go 19 kilometers west, 12 kilometers north, and about 0.45 kilometers up. As a result, one way I could write the displacement D is as negative 19i plus 12j plus 0.45k. If I use the ijk unit vectors in the x, y, and z directions respectively. Each of these three vectors that's added to give you the total displacement is called a component vector of the displacement. This means that the vector that describes the displacement has three components with one basis vector for each component. I've got the basis vector i for the 19 kilometer west component, the basis vector j for the 12 kilometer north component, and the basis vector k for the 0.45 kilometers up component. I've got one basis vector corresponding to each component. Staying with the New York theme that we've got going, suppose I'm looking at a rectangular steel beam on Brooklyn Bridge. Let's also suppose that there's a point O inside that steel beam right over here. If I wanted to specify all the stresses that are acting on point O, how would I go about doing that? Well, what I can do is make three copies of this beam, and then create a cross-section for each copy. I can make a cross-section that cuts the beam in half like this from left to right, leaving myself with just the right half of that cross-section. I can make another cross-section like this, where I split the beam into front and back and leave myself with just the back part. And then I can make a third cross-section like this, where I split the beam into up and down and leave myself with the bottom half. I'll also let the orientation of my x, y, and z axes look like this. In this first cross-section, the cross-sectional area is perpendicular to the x-direction. In other words, the x-axis makes a right angle with this yellow shaded face of the beam. Because the beam is under a whole bunch of stresses, we can say that the point O, which is on the right half of the beam, generally experiences a force per unit area from the left half of the beam, which can be broken up into three components p sub xx, p sub xy, and p sub xz. The first subscript denotes the direction the area is perpendicular to, so in this case, the first subscript x next to the p means that the cross-sectional area we're looking at is perpendicular to the x-direction. The second subscript on the p denotes the direction the force is acting in. The idea is similar for the second cross-section. The second cross-section is perpendicular to the y-direction, once again, we say that at the point O, which is now on the back half of the beam, that point O generally experiences a force per unit area from the front half of the beam. This force from the front per unit area can be broken up into the components P sub YX, P sub YY, and P sub YZ. This time the first subscript on the components of my P is Y because my cross-section is perpendicular to the Y direction. The third cross-section, which is perpendicular to the Z direction, is similar. 
point O experiences a force per unit area that can be broken down into the components P sub ZX, P sub ZY, and P sub ZZ. Again, now Z is the first subscript on the P because the area I'm looking at is perpendicular to the Z direction. We can actually combine all these forces per unit area components into a 3 by 3 matrix as follows. Now, you might be wondering, why can't I just add the forces in the same direction and end up with the force per unit area vector? For instance, why can't I just add up this PXX and this PYX? Well, it's because even though the forces are acting in the same direction at the same point, the nature of those forces is different. P sub XX acts to pull this O to the left. It wants to have O and this yellow face of the beam bulge out into the left hand side. Meanwhile, P sub YX acts to shear or drag point O and the highlighted red face of the beam to the left. It basically wants to create a three dimensional parallelogram instead of a bulge. Shearing and pulling result in the steel beam being deformed in different ways, as I've just mentioned, and that's why, in addition to specifying the force, it's necessary to specify the surface that the force acts on when looking at the stresses in a beam. So the way to specify the stresses on point O is to use this P, where each component of P corresponds to a force per unit area on a particular surface that the point O inhabits, and has a particular direction along which it acts. We can see that P has nine components, and each component is specified by a magnitude and two basis vectors, one vector for the cross-sectional area that's being acted on, and another vector representing the force acting on that cross-sectional area. This is because, as I just mentioned, we need to know both the direction of the surface area and the direction of the force if we want to specify the nature of a stress component. It's not enough to use the force direction alone. So for instance, the component P sub XX corresponds to two basis vectors in the positive X direction, while P sub XY corresponds to one basis vector in the X direction for the area and a basis vector in the Y direction for the force. We can continue this logic for all the other components of P as well. Now, all three of these mathematical objects that we talked about have something in common. They're all something we call tensors. If we're in an m-dimensional space, a tensor of rank n is a mathematical object that has n indices, m to the power n components, and obeys certain transformation rules. In the examples we talked about, we were dealing with a three-dimensional space, and in most cases that's what we'll be dealing with, a three-dimensional space. One exception is general relativity where we'll be dealing with a four-dimensional space, with time being an additional dimension. What about the rank of the tensor? Well, you can think of the rank of a tensor as the number of basis vectors you need in order to fully specify a component of the tensor. For instance, if we go back to our scalar, we can see that we needed zero basis vectors to specify our scalar component. A scalar has no direction, it's just a number, and therefore we can say that a scalar is a tensor of rank zero. What about a vector? Well, for a vector, I showed you that each component is specified by one basis vector. Therefore, we can say that a vector is a tensor of rank 1. Finally, what about our stresses on the beam? Well, I told you that in order to specify each of the nine stress components, you need two basis vectors for each component, one for the area that the stress acts on and the other for the direction of the force corresponding to that stress. This makes P a tensor of rank 2. It's also called a stress tensor. Now, the definition of tensors that I wrote down here says that the number of components in my tensor equals m to the power n. Let's verify this from the three tensors we just discussed. My scalar has a rank of 0, so it has 3 to the power 0 or 1 component, which is obviously true. My vector has a rank of 1, so it has 3 to the power 1 or 3 components, which makes sense. And p has a rank of 2, so it has 3 to the power 2 or 9 components, which also makes sense. Now something I want to mention is that even though I've written P in the form of a matrix, P is not actually just a matrix. It's a fairly common misconception that rank 2 tensors and matrices are the same thing. That's not quite correct. A matrix is just an array of numbers, whereas a tensor has special transformation properties. It obeys certain transformation rules. Of course, we can use a matrix to represent a tensor, but a tensor actually has a deeper physical significance, so it would be rather inaccurate to say that a tensor and matrix are the same thing. Now just for fun, let's also briefly mention tensors of rank 3. You can represent tensors of rank 3 as three-dimensional arrays. 
3D arrays are not the same thing as tensors, just like matrices are not the same thing as tensors, but we can use 3D arrays to represent tensors. 3D arrays, by the way, are basically matrices that are stacked on top of each other, as I've animated over here. Because this is a tensor of rank 3, each component of the tensor is specified by three separate basis vectors. In addition, a tensor of rank 3 has 3 to the power 3 or 27 components, which again follows the m to the power n component rule in the tensor definition I wrote above. Now, my goal with this video was to first get you warmed up to the idea of tensors, and to give you a bit of intuition about what tensors are. I haven't introduced tensors in the mathematically rigorous way here, but I've given you a good overview. My belief is that with this overview and intuition, you'll be better able to understand the more rigorous mathematical definitions of tensors, because in the next video, that's what I'll be going over. Specifically, I'll talk about the transformation rules that define a tensor that I didn't go over in this video. Anyway, that should do it for this lecture. But before I sign out, let's talk about this video sponsor. Brilliant.org is a great way to learn with thousands of interactive lessons covering multiple topics in math and science. These topics include everything from the history of mathematics to artificial intelligence, programming, neural networks, and more. Each lesson is specifically tailored to provide you with the problem-solving and critical thinking skills you need to master that subject area. It's also portable with a nice mobile application for learning on the go. To try everything that Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash faculty of con or click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription, so be sure to click the link and check out Brilliant. Thanks for watching.